Okay, everyone, it's one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. If you're having any trouble with your audio, again, uh, send a private message to the host and we'll try to troubleshoot the issue. Uh, but my name is Julia Proctor and I'm the Collection Services and Strategies Librarian at Penn State. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar, Bringing Social Justice Behind the Scenes, Transforming the Work of Technical Services presented by Rachel Finn and Heidi Bertu. So first, this webinar will be recorded and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording via email shortly following the webinar. Now, um, I think everybody has been muted on entry, so you just wanna check for that in the WebEx window. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located in the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window, and that should appear in the lower right corner. So Heidi and Rachel will answer, answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you'll take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we're doing, what we can do better, and share ideas for future webinars. And with that, I'll introduce our speakers for today. Heidi Bertu is the head of resource description at the Smithsonian Libraries in Washington, DC. She has been at the Smithsonian since September 2018 and has already gotten to experience a government shutdown. Prior to that, she was head of technical services at the Vassar College Libraries in Poughkeepsie, New York, where she also served as zine librarian, liaison to the Russian Studies Department, and co-chair of Vassar Library's Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Working Group. Rachel Finn is the social sciences librarian at Vassar College. In her spare time, she's developing a digital food history library to document the foodways of African Americans and the global African diaspora. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. And Heidi, I believe that you're up first. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I trust you can hear me. If not, please send uh, a chat message. Um, but as you heard from my introduction, uh, I'm, I'm no longer at Vassar, though I was at Vassar when I was doing some of this work. Um, so my presentation today is going to touch on some work from my prior library life, uh, but then also talk about new opportunities that I have here at the Smithsonian. Um, and just as a brief overview of what I'm going to discuss, uh, I'll touch on some work that I've done in tech services, initiatives at my new job, um, the importance of continuing education around this topic, and some lessons that I have learned. Uh, and I also have some slides where I pose some broader questions um, that I would be interested if, if folks in the group um, have some responses to. But so behind the scenes efforts. Uh, and I call these behind the scenes efforts uh, because I've always worked in tech services throughout my library life. Uh, and at the various libraries I've worked on, I've noticed that efforts around diversity, inclusion, or social justice sometimes seem very focused on folks in more traditional public facing roles and that it's easy for tech services to be left out of these conversations. Um, a lot of what we do talk about in tech services centers on things like production or efficiency. I thought it was only for an individual. Can somebody just join? People are supposed to be muted upon entry. I'm not sure why. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm happy to chat with you later. Uh, so a lot of talk in tech services focuses around things like production, efficiencies, and workflows, which is all fine, um, but it could be more than that. And so this is a quote that I've been thinking about a lot. This is from DJ Hudson's chapter um, called The Whiteness of Practicality, which appears in the book Topographies of Whiteness. Uh, where he writes, the tacit narrative in such imperatives to practicality is that work understood to be theoretical 
that is work concerned chiefly with foundational critique or work that does not focus on delivering measurable improvement in performance is of little relevance to the library world. And I think about that a lot with tech services work. Um, and I might be making a shaky comparison here because if you read Hudson's chapter, he's not specifically talking about tech services. And the chapter itself is much more complex. But the parallel that I see is that in our jobs, it's really easy to put a lot of focus on the practical. It's easy to kind of get lost in the practical. Um, but if that's what we're doing, you know, where are we finding those moments to kind of disrupt the system that's already there? And it's easy to fall into that trap because we're basically judged, a lot of us, um, on how well we're doing in our jobs based on these kind of practical efficiencies. So are we moving things through quickly? Are we producing at high rates? Um, but where do we find this time to think about other things that we could be doing within our departments? And so here I want to shout out Amber Billy um, from Bard College and her tweet, finally removed all references in their catalog to the Library of Congress subject heading illegal aliens and replaced with the MeSH heading undocumented immigrants, the least I can do with the power I have as systems librarian. So I think part of this is finding that balance of knowing that yes, you are in a department where you need to produce, you have limited staff time, limited resources, and you need to keep things flowing, but where are your priorities for where you can use your power to make this positive change? For me, that's meant coming together with my staff, um, with my departments, and having a lot of discussions about what are priorities for our institutions or our patrons? Where are things where we can make small changes that will have big impact? So when I was at Vassar, the way that this manifested was in my zines library. So that was a place where I worked very closely with the students and I knew the topics that were of importance to them. I knew where I could make a big impact in the catalog by doing really simple things. Um, you know, working with a student employee to summarize the zines, making sure that we had summaries in our catalog with lots of keywords, um, using local subject headings where we could. And this is something, you know, we had a lot of discussions in the department on how could we do this throughout the whole catalog. And there's always that feeling of if we can't do it with everything, is it really worth doing it with this one small thing? And I think the answer is yes. Um, it is worth making that difference in whatever way you can. You just have to know where your priorities are for your institution. And there are also initiatives like this happening outside of your institution if you want to get involved. So things like Cataloging Lab, which was started and maintained by Violet Fox, which is a place for catalogers and anyone who cares about library metadata to experiment with creating better controlled vocabularies. So if you have a subject heading that you want to propose, Cataloging Lab is a place where you can do that, where you can kind of crowdsource it, get a lot of opinions on it. Um, and they do have a track record of getting their subject headings approved and into LCSH. And a recent addition that came out of Cataloging Lab was the heading for Afrofuturism, which was just approved within the past few months. Uh, another thing that I was looking at before I left Vassar was broadening your acquisition scope. And when I'm talking about this, it's not just the what you're buying, but I'd like us to be paying more attention to how we're buying things. And this also comes kind of out of my experiences with zines, where the preferred mode of procurement is always to purchase direct from the creator. So if you have some power in deciding where your money is spent, can you explore things like using your local bookshop? using small or underrepresented or women-owned vendors instead of relying on things like Amazon. Um, so in my new position here at Smithsonian, I don't have 
any purchasing power. Um, procurement is something that if you're doing it for a federal library, you need to go through a lot of training. What I do have training on here um, that I received since starting this job is training in managing federal contracts and being a contracting officer's technical representative. And one thing that is stressed in that training that any time you have a decision to be made about a contracting procurement or a vendor, that government institutions have certain benchmarks that we are supposed to be meeting as far as giving our business to underrepresented vendors. And at institutions where I have worked previously, if there were benchmarks like this, or if there was that kind of focus going on in our campus, I wasn't aware of them in my role as acquisitions librarian. So some questions that I'm just going to toss out that we could discuss later if anyone is interested. Um, in discussions like this on, on setting time and putting focus on where you could make changes in your tech services processing, where, what would your institutional priorities be? And do you have any collections that you could easily enhance um, with positive benefits? And then I'm also really curious on if other folks are using small businesses in your acquisitions process. So new job, new opportunities, and I've only been at the Smithsonian, what, six months, seven months, but it feels like a much shorter period because we had something like a 27-day weekend in January, um, which was wild. Uh, but there are opportunities here to continue this type of work. And there's a lot of stuff that's happening in our cataloging department now, so I need to shout out the original catalogers who are already here, particularly Leslie Perilla, who's been really active um, in this work. So things that we try to do at Smithsonian is we have branch libraries in all of our museums. We also have archives in all of our museums. And we are trying to create these connections between the library staff and the museum's archival staff. Um, we're trying to set up workflows where we can get input from the archivists on names that can be created or edited in LC authority files, where we're particularly looking to amplify contributions of groups like women scientists. And we get those names from the National Museum of uh, the National Museum of Natural History. We're really big on acronyms here, um, or creating records for indigenous or underrepresented creators. And we're getting those names from the National Museum of the American Indian, the National Museum of African Art, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So we are also part of the African American Funnel Project with SACO. Um, and so this relates to a project that Rachel and I were looking at um, when I was still back at Vassar. But the African American Funnel Project is a group that works with Library of Congress and various archivist groups to rectify, where necessary, subject headings pertinent to African American experience, culture, and history. And this is great to be involved um, in this project for us because we have a lot of materials coming through. Um, our African American History and Culture Museum, our African Art Museum, and it also means that I can still collaborate with Rachel back at Vassar on gaps that she's noticing in the Vassar collection. So we also have um, diversity and equity as part of the Smithsonian Library's strategic plan. So when I came on board here, I was able to participate in kind of the end planning stages as part of that working group. And the strategic plan is about to be finalized and is calling for a broad range of initiatives from public facing programming to inclusive spaces to changes that can be implemented through cataloging and metadata. So continuing your education in this area um, is vitally important. No matter where you're working in the library, you should always be engaging and educating yourself around topics of race and inclusion. Um, and this is always part of the behind the scenes work that we can be doing. So I'm really lucky to be at an institution that's committed to inclusivity and equity, not just in thought, but in action and support 
and I want to acknowledge that. So this past December, I was able to take a month-long Library Juice Academy course called Examining Institutional Racism in Libraries. Uh, it looks like they have another one on their schedule for this August, but I would recommend it to those um, who are interested in this area. They also have what I think looks like a very interesting politics of classification course coming up in the summer. I've not taken that one yet, um, but it looks good. So I'm also part of the Conscious Inclusive Leadership Program that's being sponsored by the Museum of Natural History, um, which is home to the Central Smithsonian Libraries. So there's been a keynote speaker and four facilitated training sessions that we'll be taking part in over a six-week period. Um, sessions are including things like everyday bias, microbehavior, power and empathy training. And we learned at the first session that we went to that everyone in the program is also responsible for a, coming up with a project that we will do during the course of this training um, to make our workspace a more inclusive place. So I am happy to talk to you about my project later as well, if anyone is interested. Um, apart from that, there are lots of freely available materials online. So Whose Knowledge, which is a global campaign to center the knowledge of marginalized communities, um, has this great knowledges collection where they've published um, these four kind of brochures on things like decolonizing stories, how to be a good ally and a good guest. Um, so there's information out there if you look for it. I also wanted to say, um, in light of the racism displayed at the ALA Midwinter Conference and, and frankly, other conferences, um, I've seen calls from librarians on social media for training on things like hidden bias, nonviolent communication, and what I would categorize as bystander intervention training, which is basically learning how to get comfortable with speaking up. Um, and so I've had training in all of these areas at my former institution, though it was not something that was offered at my library. So these trainings were um, offered by student affairs professionals in the Office of Residential Life. And I received that training because I also was in the role of house fellow at Vassar, where I was a faculty member who lived inside one of our residence halls. So I got a lot of additional training. But this is just to say, particularly for those of you who are at academic institutions, that that type of training that you're looking for may already exist on your campus, but just in a different department. And so it's a good excuse to make some new friends and make some connections across campus and see if you can bring that same kind of training into your library if you have interest there. Um, this kind of continual education process, I think, is of particular importance to us white librarians, and we all need to take personal responsibility to do this work. Um, and it is a cycle of messy practice. I found that phrase in one of the Who's Knowledge publications that I referenced earlier, um, how to be a good ally and guest. So they describe being an ally as a process of learning, and that means making mistakes. And in the same way that ally is a verb, not a status, being an ally is not a static achievement, like winning an award. It is critical that we, as potential allies, reach out and dig in anyway, understanding that each slip up of language, awkward gesture, inappropriate comment, or embarrassing action, when examined openly, will help us grow. So as part of my cycle of, of messy practice here and um, continuing education, it's a useful exercise for me to look back on the successes and failings of the Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Committee that I began and co-chaired at Vassar with Rachel um, and think about what I learned from that experience. So Rachel and I spoke about this committee a lot during our NASIG presentation, so I won't rehash everything here, but just as a brief outline, this committee was formed at Vassar in the fall of 2017. It was modeled on a similar effort at the MIT University Libraries. And we came out of this working group with three goals, and that was to redo our library's mission statement, to have an internal climate assessment in our library, and to focus on creating more inclusive spaces in our library building. So in the successes column, 
um, I think the group that Rachel and I assembled was genuinely invested in making change, even if we somehow struggled with how to put our intentions into actions. And even if it wasn't a perfect conversation, we developed a plan that I, at least, felt was doable and would have encouraged participation library-wide in developing a shared vision around these issues, um, particularly the idea of crafting the new mission statement. And then the failings, I was naive to assume that everyone would inherently and immediately see the value of such a group, and I feel that I failed in adequately communicating its importance to others. I also personally failed to have a deep understanding of the existing critiques of the idea of diversity and how it plays out in many institutions before I decided to engage in this work myself. Um, and just a few resources for those who are interested in knowing more about that critique, um, articles like Todd Hahnman's Trippin' Over the Color Line, DJ Hudson's On Diversity as Anti-Racism in Library and Information Studies, and then an article by Brooke Ellenwood and Lazaro called In Pursuit of Anti-Racist Social Justice, Denaturalizing Whiteness in the Academic Library. And these are all things that I read, by the way, as part of that great library juice course that I took in December. Um, I also want to talk about this idea of how pervasive niceness um, or how the idea of niceness can derail such work. Uh, it's not meant to be a reproach of my former institution in particular here, but a reproach to all of us white librarians at many institutions. So. In her book, White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo writes, to continue reproducing racial inequality, the system only needs white people to be really nice and carry on, smile at people of color, be friendly across race, and go to lunch together on occasion. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be nice. I suppose it's better than being mean. But niceness is not courageous. Niceness will not get racism on the table and will not keep it on the table when everyone wants it off. In fact, bringing racism to white people's attention is often seen as not nice, and being perceived as not nice triggers white fragility. Um, I also, for me personally, feel it helpful to extend this idea of um, niceness is not courageous as being welcoming, I don't find necessarily that courageous either. It's better than being unwelcoming, uh, but it's really not a courageous act. It's more just the bare minimum that we should be striving for. So for me personally, when I'm coming to this work, I try to put myself into a different mindset. So even if I do consider myself a nice or, or welcoming person, um, it can't be in the forefront of my consciousness, or it's too easy for me to turn it into a defense mechanism or to use it as a confirmation that my work is somehow done. So instead of showing up as a group of nice professionals, um, I would rather see white librarians show up as a group that is humble, ready to listen, ready to accept critique and advice, able to calm our emotions and accept discomfort, and wanting to put in work. And just a few more questions um, that we could maybe be thinking about, but I, I'm curious to know who else has been involved with this kind of work at their libraries around diversity inclusion. Um, do you have lessons you'd like to share with the group? Because I would love to hear them. Uh, and then where have people seen themselves or their institutions grow through this work? Uh, and that's all that I have, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rachel. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm just here trying to get uh, switch the slides. Here we go. Um, thanks so much, Heidi. That, uh, that was really great. Um, uh, I sort of makes me feel, um, you know, the conversations that we've had about how we take the lead in doing, um, in, in doing work that helps to make librarianship, libraries um, more inclusive. Um, that you know, like we've both been both been thinking about it, and both are on on a very similar, uh, I guess, page. And and um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm excited to, to, to be able to talk about this um, along with you and also um, with everyone who's actually joined, um, I'm excited to take the webinar. Um, so again, my name is Rachel Finn, and right now I'm the social science librarian at Vassar College. Um, this is, uh, prior to, to working here, I primarily worked in archives, um, doing a lot of processing, and, um, and in library school, I did, I studied mostly um, archives and special collections librarianship, and um, before that, I was a teacher, a high school teacher um, in, in Chicago, so in big urban environments with um, kids coming from all different backgrounds, racial, um, economic, ethnic, all, everything that you can think of. So I bring all that with me as I um, enter the profession and it kind of shapes how I work with students and certainly how I approach like the things that we offer to students and to researchers in general, to our user populations um, as, um, as librarians. So right now, I'd just like to talk a bit about making our library collections more inclusive. Um, uh, I think it's very important that we think about like the power, like what we bring to the table, the baggage that we bring to the table, um, and also the power that we bring to the table as librarians. So um, I found this quote some time ago um, and thought really, this is, this is so important. One of the pieces that, that kind of goes out the window in librarianship because there's such a strong focus as Heidi touched upon, upon like measurable, um, measurable results that we get through analysis of reports and so forth and, um, and tallying statistics that I really think that it's important when we're talking about how we're going to rebuild or reconstruct collections as we talk about how we're going to, sh to, to address these really important shifts that are taking place in librarianship that we need to think about where we stand. So our social situations, our backgrounds and what we bring. Um, as, as Sandra Harding says, um, uh, they enable us to set, the social situations enable us to set limits on what we can know. Um, and, 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 so, and also what we can do then. Um, some social situations critically unexamined dominant ones in particular are more limiting than others in this respect. And what makes these situations more limiting is their inability to generate the most critical questions about received belief. And I think because as librarians we often see, see ourselves as the good guys, um, that, that this is a liberal profession, um, it's very hard for us to turn a critical eye on ourselves and also to think that things that we might be doing, um, things that we might be producing are perpetuating inequality, per perpetuating exclusivity, and those are the things that we really want to think about when we're, when we're talking about um, creating more inclusive collections. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about my perspective on the DISJ working group at Vassar, and, and this is one of the things, like Heidi and I, talked so much about these issues of what we bring to the table, of these sort of hidden biases and all these things as we began to think about how we could um, collaborate to create this working group that is, of course, based on, um, based on uh, efforts at MIT, um, DISJ initiatives at MIT. Um, I think that, uh, again, um, this effort was, was one in which we hope to get librarians um, and archivists here to think about the ways in which we wield power um, and the, the ways in which um, we can sort of, I guess, open the things up that we do and, and, and sort of critically examine our own practices so that we can provide better services to our user populations. I would say that, um, um, changes in society and the profession um, are encouraging us to have a much more critical analysis of ourselves, of our lives, of our histories, and the way they intersect in the stuff in what we do every day at work. Um, and I'm ho and we hoped, and I, I continue to hope, um, but certainly as we we tried to create this group, we hoped that um, in assembling this group of colleagues that we would be able to work 
with those colleagues who seem very interested in this process, who are very dedicated and motivated to, to examine these things, along with the institution to, to do more than pay lip service to the ideals of inclusivity and social justice. Um, and, and, and really begin to address that on a larger scale here at Vassar. Um, so uh, the, the thing that we hope to do, as, as Heidi went over, um, is that we wanted to redo the mis mission statement. We hoped to conduct an internal assessment of the library climate so we can see just, just where everyone was at in terms of what they viewed to be like the most um, pressing issues uh, in our work environment um, with respect to diversity, inclusion, inclusion, and social justice, and also to try to promote the creation of inclusive spaces within the library. And um, the idea was that uh, by addressing all of these things, by thinking about all of these things, we would be able to create these um, new ways of thinking and these new ways of moving the space that would allow us to, to really sort of imbue our work from acquisitions, from cataloging, to processing, to reference services, for instance, um, with this new, um, this new way of approaching incorporating social justice into the work that we do. Um, we had um, mixed results, <laughs> and Heidi talked a bit about her, her perspective on it, and I, I think as, um, as a black woman, I had a little bit of a different perspective, and also as a woman who worked very, um, um, worked with students who came from the backgrounds that were starting to welcome on, on a larger scale at Vassar, who come maybe less, less prepared or prepared in different ways for li life and interacting in the sort of environment that we have here in Vassar, I had different perspectives on like what was positive and what, what those positives or those neg negatives were, what those successes and those failures were. For me, um, it really revealed um, the levels of receptiveness in my colleagues to critical approaches to the work that we do as, as librarians and information professionals in general. And I was pleasantly surprised, to be honest, I thought, um, people were very much open to, uh, the group that we assembled at least, were very much open to what we wanted to do um, in the context of this group. Um, it opened a dialogue between receptive colleagues within and outside the committee. So we were able to connect. Because it can be such a touchy subject to address issues that really just change the culture in this way, um, with respect to race and racism, per respect to exclusion on other levels, whether race, whether disability, whether sexuality, wherever the case may be, it allowed people to connect um, and know that other people were out there um, and had the same, and, and were thinking along the same lines so that perhaps there could be further dialogue. Um, I'll say that, um, there became, even outside of this small group of people, that, um, the idea that, yeah, critical approaches matter. Like, more matter than those measures of assessment, those reports, those analysis of statistics at the circulation desk and so forth. More we need, and, and that even within the context of those, those measurements, we need, to, we need to actually sort of evaluate and approach um, how we analyze those things a little bit more critically. Now, for me, the negatives um, of this and, and, um, or the failures, whatever you prefer, um, the negatives of the whole thing were came, even at the start, part of what caused us to, to, to sort of begin, begin these discussions and what motivated Heidi to start the process of, of, of recruiting for this group was that you know, there were a few, um, I just have to be very frank and say um, irresponsible collection development choices and irresponsible ways in which those choices were um, sort of shared with the library community, both the, um, both people who work, the, the staff members, uh, as well as um, the user community. Um, uh, and it, it was very, it was a very hurtful situation and so, um, it really sort of opened my eyes to um, 
to thinking about how you proceed um, in the library environment when you're acquiring materials that are sensitive or when you're requiring you're acquiring materials that have the potential to, potential to be used in ways that may harm a user community or even a staff community in a library. Um, I would say that there is also a general lack of institutional support or concern in many ways beyond the small group of people who are very um, committed to the process of, of learning more, of, of talking about diversity, inclusion, and social justice in the context of our library. And that was very unfortunate, though not surprising to me. Um, I would say that one of, the, one of a really key unfortunate development to me was, but, and again, not surprising, was this an increased um, instance increased instances of performative activism um, and of performative, like, I guess I'll say programming um, that came up to, to, uh, to, I guess, to address the issues that were brought about by those collection development choices and then soon died down or soon disappeared. Um, and it was really unfortunate because it was such a moment that could be, have been used to seize, um, seize opportunities that would that would incorporate inclusivity, help us be able to incorporate, think about incorporating inclusivity and social justice into the work that we do. It, it was just a lost opportunity. And of course, none of these things are, are uh, particular to Vassar. I know this has happened at institutions everywhere, but these are just some of the things that I thought were important to bring up. Um, I also feel like um, the final um, negative uh, outcome was that there really was sustained resistance at very high levels in the library to incorporating diversity, social justice, and, 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 and inclusion, and inclusion um, initiatives into everyday, the everyday here in the library. And, and it really didn't have to be that way. Um, it's just it's just how it played out, and it's unfortunate. However, for me, what began to help me, what, what, what that did for me was start, make me start to think about how I could consciously um, begin to incorporate these things and how I could consciously incorporate them and also begin to document how I incorporated these these values into the work I do um, every day, um, and so I started seeking out like doing research, trying to seek out theory about this stuff because I was trained and trained as an archivist. I thought, okay, you know, there's so much archival theory about every aspect of what you could be doing, how you could, how you you know what you collect what you what you call what you you know how how you name how you describe um and i thought okay there's got to be some of that too as i began you know in this my first librarian position as a full-time librarian and there just wasn't any there wasn't much if any that existed um and i just thought that if there were and i continue to think that if there were a theory if we stopped and thought critically about what we do and we document that, um, it would help guide us so much better in, in the work that we do. And certainly as, as I speak further about how we can um, develop our collections. Um, I think it's pretty important that we actually um, look at, you know, I guess we could say like a governing body for li librarianship and, and look at, you know, some of the things that they are saying and particularly this quote that is in, within the code of ethics of the American Library Association. Um, just says that we significantly influence or control the selection, organization, preservation, and dissemination of informa information. Um, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to election, intellectual freedom and freedom of access to information. And so we have a special obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present, to, excuse me, to present and future, future generations. So when I started to think about this particular quote, 
I really thought that, okay, um, our collections, um, because our collections are outward facing, um, what people see of our collections are, um, there are reflections of the values that we have as institutions and certainly as a profession. And when I looked at the collections, um, when I started working in all of the different departments I have, and I saw just so many gaps and gaps in, in, in what we have to offer students. And, and because I'm, uh, I also have liaison duties and I, and I do reference, I sit with students regularly and I hear the topics, particularly like sort of like the group of students who's now the, the more diverse body of students who are coming into the institution, coming to me and wanting, coming to all of the librarians and wanting to um, uh, research and write about topics, do projects on things that we just don't address in, the, in, in our collection. And I thought, okay, um, how must this lack of um, documentation, how much, this, how much must this lack of res resources how, how, what must it communicate to these students who are coming trying to do work that um, we are charging them to do in their classes? Um, so I, I began to think more and more about this idea that we do have this special obligation uh, um, to, to present information to future generations and that we need to begin because of the shift in society and, and in our profession, we need to think about how we're going to do that. We need to address it. Um, so what I started to think about is how we can actually, you know, I, I've seen this word thrown around a lot, decolonizing, um, decolonizing collections, decolonizing librarianship. And, you know, I have a little bit of a background from graduate school, pre-library graduate school and, and studying colonialism um, uh, throughout, um, um, uh, well, around the world. And so as I think about what it means to decolonize something um, and what, what it will mean for us as librarians to take those steps, um, I also thought about what, it, what we need to do in terms of reconstructing or rebuilding those collections. And so one of the, what I want to kind of focus on as I go forward is some steps that you can take or maybe like approaches that you can take to do those things. Um, I think that uh, the changes, um, again, in our professional la landscape, which I consider to be good, are, are reshaping traditional no notions of access that we have. Um, and um, as such, uh, we're opening our eyes and even, um, especially when the context, within the context of a profession and institutions that are inherently exclusive and and or even meant to uphold the status quo, we're opening our eyes to the omissions, exclusions, and oversights of the past in all areas of librarianship, and certainly in collection development and collection building. And I believe that particularly in academic libraries, this might take on the greatest urgency in, in collection development or acquisitions. Um, so the question then becomes, how do we arrive at theory that guides and, and decolonizes collection development practices? Um, and I, I think that um, I would love to hear ideas about this as we, um, you know, at the end, when, when, if, if you have ideas, if there are things that you're employing in the work that you do every day, I'd love to hear about this. Um, um, I'd love anyone to, to give me their answers to this question. Um, but what I came to think of is that we really need to um, think about first what's missing. Um, I think it's really important to to consider the fact that um, most common the most common ways that we evaluate and build our collections uh, and maintain them. Um, so uh, what I and what I realized when I came here is that there was a strong strong reliance on approval plans. And I think um, uh, one of the reasons for that one of the reasons I was given for that is that you know there's just so much work there's just so no time in our schedules to to sort of critically evaluate and shift and change the, the ways in which we um, choose the materials, the items that we add to our collections. And so that's true, but um, yeah, it's kind of a cop-out because it's something that we have to do if we want 
the work that we do to line up with the values that we say that we have. Um, so what do we do? We rely on approval plans. Again, as I said, we focus on result on reports. We focus on statistics, analysis of subject headings, and so forth, which again, we do need to do those things. But I think one of the key things that we need to begin thinking about in addition to, um, you know, um, the suggestions that Heidi gave about, you know, gender relationships and um, um, publishers and where we actually buy our materials that we need to think about uh, how, how we use the statistical information, how we use the reports, how we use the analyses, and, and turn a critical eye to the, the information that we get from these things. Um, and of course, another big one um, is how we review our course catalogs. Um, or reviewing our course catalogs and seeing what we need to provide for classes that are being offered. And all of these are certainly, you know, they're ways to build our collection, but what they've done is left us with gaps, and what they've done is left us with a lot of um, situations where we just don't, not even gaps, but just areas where we just haven't collected at all, like collections that don't exist because we have focused, we have narrowed our focus on, on um, these particular ways, like these most acceptable ways to, um, to build a collection. Um, so as quoted earlier, um, um, we make decisions, the way we make decisions is influenced by our social situations and by tr traditional practices in libraries. Um, in other words, what is acceptable in the context in, in the context of library and information science. And these are the things that are most accessible. And they're the easiest. And so it's a little bit hard to make that shift, but we got to do it. Um, and, and these are the things that I started to think about and that it's sort of like ingrained um, in, in my, you know, my psyche that, you know, I have to find a different way to do this. And I'm still working on that. Um, and I'm going to share some of the ways that, you know, I've tried to do that. But I have to also point out that one of the things that really has me, made me be very um, um, committed to this was hearing many, many times in my work at Vassar, hearing that, you know, the ways that I was approaching things, the things that I was suggesting were just not not how we do things here, not how we traditionally do things in librarianship. Um, really, really motivate, motivated me even more to try to take an approach to um, the collection development work that I had to do as part of my role in a different way so that I could really give students um, and give researchers, give user populations, um, um, what they needed, what they seemed to need when they came in to talk to me about things. And I think one of the things that we can do when we, when we do this, when we think about our collections and we broaden them, we make them more inclusive, that's one of the ways that we make people feel at home in our institutions, in our libraries. It's one of the things that makes them feel welcome. Because if they know that their interests are represented um, to a degree <laughs> with, um, within our collections, then then they know it's a place where, where they were intended to be all along. Um, so, um, and again, this is my reason for, for saying that we need to critically, that we need to think critically and that we need to reflect and we need to create maybe a little theory on this. Um, so why theory? Uh, as I said before, um, collections are outward facing, right? Um, um, and they, along with the processes we adopt to make them accessible to our users, have the potential to do, to do more, and they really should. Um, again, so if we're if we're if we're serious about inclusion and social justice, um, um, our collections have to mirror that. When our collections mirror that, then our user population, then for a lot of us in academic institutions, our students, they notice those things. They notice that there are, you know. Um, scholarly work on the shelves about black women's hair or about, you know, um, Asian American struggles or about um, Native Americans that are, that are, that have to do with more than just sort of like viewing them or studying them from an anthropological lens. They notice those things. Um, so we have to evaluate uh, the first, the first step. Um, we have to evaluate where we are currently and think critically about the steps we take 
to get to where we want to be or where we say we want to be. Um, and I feel like developing some collection development theory can be a roadmap for that journey. And one of the things, like, while I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm going to come out of this presentation with, you know, theory, I, I mean, I guess I would challenge people who have, have, who are listening today to, to think about what that could look like. Is that something that you could begin to write about and think about in, in the publishing that you do for work? Um, is it something you're interested in? Because I think that we really need some, some places to start, some places to discuss so that we can move forward um, with not necessarily guidelines, but things that help people critically reflect on and how how we're putting these collections together. Um, and I also want to say just quickly, um, I mentioned diversity a couple of times here and um, as I've talked, and one of the things that I really, I, I tend not to use the word diversity, um, and, and, and particularly not in the context of like the things that we, we're talking about here, or really in any context, because for me, um, diversity implies, you know, difference. It implies something that's different from the norm. And I certainly don't think of myself as a black woman being different from the norm or any of the, the students uh, from underrepresented groups, whether whatever that difference may be, as being different, as different from what is normal. I mean, and we all know what we consider normal. So I think language matters. So I really try. Um, so one of the reasons I said creating inclusive, inclusive collections and trying to incorporate inclusivity rather than diversifying is because that's what we want to do. I mean, even that bothers me a little bit. Because um, what we want to do is just make this a thing where, where this is how we do it. We flip a switch in our brains where we're actually, we don't, we don't think that we're doing something special or adding something new or something different to our collection by collecting on underrepresented groups or events that affect those groups, or his history that affect those groups. Um, we don't think we're doing something different. We just begin to consider that this is what we have to have in these collections. This is what we need. This is part of all of our histories. Um, so again, that, that's part of why I've, I've been avoiding <laughs> and, and been like really repetitive and in saying inclusive, inclusivity and inclusive and, and, and that sort of thing, because it just, Diversity is a is a, a challenging term for me. I just wanted to to to, um, to mention that. So where do we start? Um, I think uh, we begin to um, as we start to think about how we do this, um, um, we have to acknowledge that some of us, many of us, maybe all of us, because we all, no matter what our background, um, if, we're in, if, we're, if we're librarians, we have a measure of privilege. So we actually, and we've been shaped by certain, certain norms and certain ways of thinking. So um, we have to start by realizing that like, we actually, um, we think less expansively than we should, perhaps. So we have to teach ourselves. We have to, we have to dismantle. We have to unlearn what guides our choices and mindset, mindsets, whether we're collection building from scratch or filling in gaps. Um, as I said before, Heidi covered some of those practical steps, um, and I mentioned that again. You know, vendor relationships, um, buying from bookstores. Someone mentioned that they buy they're buying from local bookstores that we're that we're checking out independent publishers and that sort of thing, um, buying from the creators of this work. Um, um, and, and of course, we want to identify new ones. But we're thinking out new places um, that allows us to sort of tap into information that helps us expand our thinking and make our own thinking more inclusive. Um, and I want to say that if you don't know, um, you know, you got to figure it out. We're librarians. That's what we do. Those of us who work with students every day, that's what we tell them. Figure it out. Do the research. Um, you know, um, um, we teach those skills every day. Um, I want to say, and, and this is from experience, please don't ask people of color um, or members of the LGBTQ community or anyone else who has a, you know, um, identifiable difference, if you will, don't, don't expect that those people are the people who will address these gaps or who will address building these collections um, where, we're, where we're lacking um, 
um, materials that we should probably have in our collections. Um, don't do that. Um, I, I feel like having experienced it multiple times, I feel like it's important enough to actually state. <laughs> um, so I think I think it's it's really important. Um, I think just in a practical note, just really quickly, um, for me, uh, just. Um, I have an anecdote about this is like I was in a meeting and we were talking about this very thing, you know, I, I brought up the, you know, students coming and asking for different things in different areas. Um, I, I work with Africana Studies, um, uh, one of the multidisciplinary programs, and so we have Asian Studies, we have Latino, uh, Latina Studies, Hispanic Studies, and so forth. And so um, one of the things that came up at, is that um, in our meeting was that, oh, well, how do we fill in this gap? How do we learn about this stuff? This is from my colleagues. And I said, okay, <laughs> um, isn't that, again, isn't that what we teach our students? Like, you figure out how you learn about this stuff. Because I had been told many times, okay, well, if you find that there's a gap or you have a suggestion for books, just email them to me and I'll get them. Well, no, because it's not my job as the person of color, as the black woman, to know all about these things and to, to fill in these gaps. It's all of our jobs to do this. Um, so one of the things I think are, as a practical suggestion, like for me this is really helpful and I do have a background on try to stay abreast of issues even outside of my job as a librarian about issues, histories, et cetera, um, um, that have to do with different, just about everything. But I think Twitter is a really good um, tool for that, particularly if you start following um, researchers, uh, historians, if you're following scholars, if you're following organizations, um, news outlets, a lot of people post like book suggestions, you know, like if they're publishing or what they're reading. And you get, you're, you're able to kind of go through and, and, and for me, what I do is like, I like all these things and every, and periodically I go through and I like look, I look in our catalog, I look up these books, I see what's what, I see what's going to be released, you know, what's just about to be published. Uh, it's a really, really great tool and it's really simple. I mean, it does require that you kind of like cultivate like your Twitter um, list, the people that you follow, the people who follow you, so that you can kind of um, stay up on things. But I think it's a really good tool. Uh, for me, it's been invaluable, and I've learned a lot. And I just wanted to throw that out there as we get into um, talking about um, how to, to, to collect. And I think um, what Heidi mentioned, some of the organizations, some of the tools that Heidi mentioned are also really useful. I think it's really important to explore media and content created by um, underrepresented groups um, that, you know, are outside the mainstream. Um, and that really helps you learn about not only issues, but in publications and all the other things that, that kind of escape you if, if you don't expose yourself to those things. Um, So I've tried to think about the ways that I actually collect and, and document them, and I have a couple of suggestions that I think embody the values that we say that we want to incorporate. Um, collections, again, I can't stress this enough, they're outward facing. And so one of the things that I try to do is, you know, for instance, for Africana, for instance, um, what I try to do is like center a topic um, like I could just center Africana, but I center a topic in Africana. And then what I do is something that, you know, I've called spiral collecting. So that central topic and then placing subtopics on a continuum that kind of links them um, and, and, and allows the collector to make further connections between them. Um, so um, it's almost like you can it, you can identify these different aspects or facets of a topic, important and related issues that can take us um, into the territory of of addressing intersections within a particular topic that allow us to really sort of flesh out the collection um, on a particular topic. And this is really I think this is really useful, especially when we're thinking about like um, like like those multidisciplinary programs we have. Um, um, and, and, and helps us 
also to like identify the issues that we need to know about as librarians who are collecting on topics that students are using to, to do their research, that they're using to learn about the topics that, that they're studying in class. So it's really, I think, really useful. Um, I think in, the, in this way, by doing it this way, it's possible for the collector to reflect and research um, in, in the field um, or even study other library co collections to think in depth about important topics or issues related to a group, event, idea, or individual, and then collect along the spiral. Um, um, and uh, this, I think, it, I think it really helps to ensure that important issues um, aren't neglected. Because uh, it's really easy to to find that you have like nothing on, you know, like what I mean, not womanism, of course. Of course, you have something on womanism in an African American or Africana studies collection. But um, just as an example, it's really easy to sort of overlook things, particularly if you're not familiar with a topic and you're coming into it um, um, brand new. Uh, and it just gives you things to search when you're searching for things that you're that you're when you're doing when you're seeking out things to to incorporate into the collection. Um, the next um, the next sort of uh, approach that I like to take because I actually ended up with a few different um, um, as a social sciences librarian I ended up with departments like economics I ended up with departments like you know, sociology and even anthropology that I'm less familiar with. Um, and, but I did know, but I did evaluate those collections and the catalog and the stacks and saw that we're missing so much that, that, that we need to sort of make, I, I hesitate to call the collection holistic, but really that's what it is, to broaden the collection, to make it more inclusive, to touch on issues um, besides, you know, um, those great men, great events, and so forth. Um, so with expansive scope or concentric collections, in this case, um, we have an issue in the center. So in this case, African American women. So what we then do is think about like African American women in history. So like if we're going to buy in history, we want to buy things that have that are by African American women and about African American women. And then even then, maybe we start to incorporate some of those issues within um, those, the issues from the other type of collecting, those issues we've identified. And then we talk about those, we buy on those throughout history. Um, and so that's a way to kind of round out collections when we're talking, when we want to like, I think, um, I think this is particularly good for filling in gaps. Um, um, in, in, a very, in various subject areas. It is multidisciplinary. Again, the focus is on the broad topic, whether it be sociology, whether it be education, whether it be chemistry, for instance. And it encourages librarians, liaisons, or subject area experts or general selectors um, to document what's usually not documented. Again, I repeat this in a collection. Um, and thinking about, again, I repeat, how those groups and their related issues intersect with that topic. Um, so if we wanted to talk about like um, womanism and how it manifested particularly maybe in the sciences, um, this gets us thinking about how to do this as we, as we um, center a topic within a broader subject area, if that makes sense. Um, I think in this case, and even in the other case too, like it can be really helpful to collect around issues questions or aspects of a topic that allow you to broaden and round out collections um, with, ma with materials that break our old habits of, you know, sort of collecting on the same types of things we always have. Um, so that students then have the opportunity to like come in, they, they can be creative with the things that they're studying. They can learn and broaden the scope of, you know, what they're learning about in, in their classes and, and and so forth, um, and, and, and take that into the independent work that they're doing. So um, as I come to the end of this, I think it's really important that we think, if we're thinking about how we're actually going to incorporate this stuff and really be practical, you know, the practical ways in which we actually build our collections and acquire materials for our collections, um, I think it's going to be really important for critical reflection. I go back to this idea of like I really challenge and encourage people to think about like what 
does collection development theory look like? What can it look like? And can we start to work on that and build a body of, of, of scholarship that focuses on collection and critical collection development? So thinking about what's missing and why as we create that. Um, I think the next thing that's going to be really important is asking tough questions and challenging current and existing praxis. Um, and I hope that, you know, like, uh, sometimes it's easier just kind of to do it than to think about it, because maybe we can do it and then document it, and that becomes like the basis of the theory that we need to sort of guide us through and that can help others through the process. Um, and I think finally, um, for me, understanding that by not doing the above, that we maintain the status quo and, and, and the structures of hegemony that sort of like, um, that are, that are maintained by libraries, to be honest. Um, and, that, and that when we actually embrace non-traditional and non-critical, or I should say traditional and non-critical practice, that we're just a part of that. We're a part of that sort of like infinite loop of, of the same thing, like not sort of changing or shifting and not growing to meet, um, to meet the shifts in society and also the shifts in, um, in our own profession, and certainly not um, aligning our work with the values of social justice, social, social justice and inclusion that we say um, that we say that we support. Um, so with that, I thank you so much. Um, and if you have any questions, if you'd like a list of the references, um, a list of references from myself or from Heidi, you can email me and then I'll type up and send you a copy of everything that we've, um, we, we've used to in the work that we've done in our presentation at NASIC and also in this webinar today. Um, so thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Rachel and Heidi. Uh, we're, it's a little bit after two, but there is one question in the Q&A box. Is it okay to, to ask that question? Do you both have time? You're both muted. Oh, yes. Hi, I'm back. This is Heidi. Yes, okay. I am still here. I'm sorry that we, we ran late. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so the question is, what resources do you recommend for evaluating collections for problematic materials? Rachel, I'm going to let you handle this one. Um, resources for evaluating collections for pro problematic materials. Um, I guess I would say, um, for me, I mean, I don't have a place, I don't have um, any like volumes that I consult for that, but I use, I really do use my own um, um, background, I guess, study in history, my knowledge of a particular topic. I talk to, I talk to professors, I talk to um, other sort of experts in the field to find out more. I read, um, um, I read the material sometimes and I also um, read reviews, um, but I can't, like, I don't actually, um, there's no book that I consult to do that. I think it's just been a process of learning and being committed to sort of know more about the field that, um, and, and also having the luck to know, to, to ha have a measure of um, knowledge um, in the field that I actually collect for. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's kind of what I do. I don't know if you had other suggestions at all, Heidi, about that. Um, so I don't necessarily evaluate collections as, as part of my job. Um, one thing, rather than problematic materials, I'm kind of always on the lookout um, for subject headings that are problematic. And again, my resource for that essentially is, is conversations that are happening in the field amongst catalogers um, and trying to take part in those conversations around, you know, what what subject headings are we looking at? What kind of subject headings need to be revised? And if we aren't seeing that kind of revision happening through um, the process that, that Seiko has in place, then what kind of rises to the top for me at a, at a local 
level of something where I want to make a change in house, either you know using a local subject heading or looking outside for a different thesaurus that I can use. Um, but I, I don't know that I have a specific resource. It's more just trying to stay well informed of the conversations that are happening and not just in the field, but what's important to researchers at your institution, what are things that they're trying to search for and maybe aren't having any luck. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, but I want to thank, thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you at our next continuing education event. And thank you very much, Rachel and Heidi, for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much.